Welcome to Talk Wildlife. Uh, today I will be talking to Harriet Lambert, who is a PhD student at the ETH in Zurich. So first of all, hi, how are you Harriet? I'm fine, how are you? And you've probably noticed that that isn't a Zurich accent at all, that's a nice Welsh accent for us. <laughs> so at least we'll be able to understand one another, which is a great start. Um, right, so what we're going to talk about today is a fantastic piece of research you've done. And if people thought bumblebees were fascinating before this interview, by the end of this video, I can guarantee you that you're going to find them even more fascinating. And you're certainly going to learn something new about bumblebee behaviour, because I certainly did reading this fantastic paper that's been put together by yourself. So first of all, let's talk about you. Um, PhD student, what is it you're actually studying? Uh, so I work at the Biocommunication Lab at ETH and um, so basically we study how uh, information is transferred between um, different organisms and specifically kind of plant insect interactions. Uh, so my focus is kind of plants and pollinators which is why I work with bumblebees um, and we try and understand kind of how they interact with plants, how that affects their development and their behaviour and also their kind of reproductive success. Right. OK, and how long have you been doing that now? I, yeah, quite a long time in my in my final year. Uh, I started in the Christmas of 2016. 2016, great. OK, well, before, because I think what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about bee behaviour, bumblebee behaviour. Uh, but before I do, I have to congratulate you because the paper is really, really interesting. It's really good. It's a great piece of research. Um, so we'll come on to that in a second as to what prompted you to actually do that piece of research, because it's 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 it is really fascinating. Um, but first of all, let's just talk about bumblebees, because bumblebees are, everybody knows them, they see them around the gardens, um, there's various sort of different species, um, but they sort of follow a similar pattern when it comes to their life cycle and their lifestyle. So can you use a little bit of background about, sort of from when you first see a queen bumblebee flying around your garden, what happens next? How does that hive get established? Uh, well, like you said, bumblebees are really interesting um, and they're, especially for research, they're a really great model to use because like honeybees, bumblebees are social bees. Uh, they build a nest and they have this social kind of um, organisation and like solitary bees and they're really fascinating to study, but they don't have very large hives, so they're not insanely complex sometimes like honeybees are. Um, unlike honeybees, bumblebees only have this annual life cycle. So uh, a hive will only live for one year. So what will happen is that a freshly mated queen who has hibernated over winter uh, will emerge in early spring. Um, and in particularly, I study the buff-tailed bumblebee. That's our model that we use, which is known as Bombus terrestris. Um, and these are very early emerging bumblebees. So she will emerge really early, kind of late February, kind of early March round of time. Um, and what she will do is um, she'll be very hungry after her long winter hibernation, so she, immediately she'll want to go and find some food. Um, so she will forage around and often you can see these queens kind of in early spring kind of sunbathing as well, that's a behaviour that they, they engage in. Um, and then what will happen is that she will try to locate, the, locate a nest. So once she's found a good position, um, that she really likes the sight of. She will basically go and collect uh, a lot of nectar um, and a lot of pollen and she'll build like a little pollen sausage and she will build a nectar pot and then she will lay her first um, batch of eggs in that pollen sausage and she will incubate those um, and then that first generation will hatch. And then after that, after this founding stage, the queen will no longer leave the nest, but her workers, who are all her daughters, uh, will forage for her and they will start developing the colony. And it's kind of interesting, the colony will really kind of exponentially grow and um, they can put on like 10 times their weight in about three to four weeks. So they're really efficient foragers, as you can kind of see, they see them very commonly around the garden and they are kind of very general. They forage on lots of different plants and, and they all really build the colony. And then over early summer and late summer, the colony will exponentially grow. Um, and for Bombus terrestris, typically they might get even up to like 400 workers. Um, and then the colony will enter its reproductive cycle. So they will stop just laying workers, but they will start to lay the new generation of young queens and, and males, which are known as drones. Um, and then at that stage, the new queens of the new males will leave the nest um, and go and mate. 
And then the cycle starts again. So those new queens will go and find a little burrow and hibernate for winter, ready for next spring. I'm going to ask you a question here that just sprung into my head. And I don't know whether, I mean, I'm sure if there is an answer, I must have read it at some stage, but I can't remember. You said that at some point they, um, they start producing males. What's the trigger for that? Is it, you know, how do they go, all right, well, I think I'll start producing males now. Uh, this is very interesting. So we often think about honeybees um, have this very complex society and we all have heard of royal jelly. So this special kind of secretion that honeybees feed to their larva to determine like whether they will be become workers or they will enter this queen caste. Um, for bumblebees, it's a little bit more complicated. So there is no evidence that they will secrete any kind of compound or give their larva a different diet to determine what they will become. Um, but what's been established is that there seems to be some kind of pheromonal control. So the queen somehow dictates what the larvae will be, because all larvae um, have the potential to be anything, a worker, a queen, a male, but it seems to be very much queen controlled. So yeah. at this stage, she will determine what the larvae will be, and it's believed to be um, a pheromone that will kind of manipulate the juvenile hormone of the larvae when it's in this very early development, so maybe like two to four days. Um, so it's kind of very interesting how they communicate. It's very sophisticated um, and there's still a lot to find out. Yeah, I can imagine. I, that is really quite weird. So mm -hmm. yeah, as I say, endlessly fascinating bumblebees. Um, so, so that's how it happens. Um, but is there a trigger or is it just that the the queen decides right now's the time, or is there something, and I say that there may not even be an answer for this yet because it might not have been researched yet, but you know, is it a change in, you know, day length? Is it change in temperature? Is it, or is it just purely the queen decides now's the point? Well, the queen, obviously she has the capacity to, do, to make new uh, queens and males from the very beginning when the nest first establishes, she doesn't. They obviously have this growth phase and then they hit this reproductive switch phase. And it does seem to be very much a switch where they go from purely kind of worker um, growth and then they switch into laying these new reproductive models. So um, I think the research is fairly mixed, but it does seem to be, there seems to be some kind of tipping point that the queen will recognize and then she'll say, okay, now we need to switch into reproductive um, yeah. mode. It's amazing. You just can't get your head around it, really, can you? It's like, yeah, all right, but how did they make that decision? But anyway, let's move on a little bit. So we now know that's how a life cycle of the bumblebee works. And we know that it is really key that in order for that not to crumble, there's got to be flowers. And this is where your research came in. So first of all, if you tell us what prompted you to do the research either as an organization or yourself what prompted that research what where did the decision come from that you suddenly thought oh we need to test this uh well i've always been interested in bumblebees and we knew we were very much going to do this pollinator research so we were working with hives um kind of in the early days of my phd like many discoveries this seemed to happen by chance um so we were just doing some routine experiments and um, we were trying to pollinate some plants uh, in our climate chambers uh, when we noticed that these bees were behaving really oddly and really strangely. And it was only from these observations initially that we were like, oh, this is very interesting. Is it just an artifact or is there something going on here? Because it was so weird and so strange. Um, and then we decided that we would actually pursue that and see if, if it was uh, just an artifact or whether it was something going on. And then we repeated experiments for several years um, and every colony we got under the right conditions would start performing this weird behavior. And after many experiments, um, we decided that, yeah, this is a real thing. <laughs> right. OK. And great. So now what we'll do is we'll introduce this weird behavior. So this weird behavior is that they, bees, honeybees, sorry, bumblebees that you've you've studied can trigger a plant to flower. Is that right? Yes, so the bumblebees can yeah. kind of fast track flowers uh, when they are hungry. <laughs> right, okay, so can you explain how they do that please? 
so when we very first initially saw this, um, we had left this hive to its own devices um, with a bunch of plants that needed to be pollinated. And when we were checking up on them, we really noticed that the bumblebees were actually not uh, going for the flowers. They were actually spending a lot of time on the leaves. And what seemed to be even more strange is that they were actually damaging the leaves. They were using their tongues um, and their mandibles and specifically to make these very tip like uh, typical shaped holes. They look like little smiles um, in, in the leaves of the plants itself. And, and um, at some point they would really kind of begin to trash these plants. So this seemed to be a very strange behavior that we'd never seen before. Um, so we spoke with a couple of professors, we asked around if anyone had seen this, um, we spoke to the company that supplied us these bees, uh, and they um, hypothesized that, oh, um, either something is, you know, something is really wrong with these, maybe they're diseased, or maybe this is kind of uh, related to their diet, maybe they are really hungry and they are um, doing this for a kind of strange reason. Um, so we decided from then we would continue to try and figure out why they were doing this. Um, initially, once we uh, decided that, you know, maybe they were doing this for a reason um, and multiple hives, it wasn't just one random hive, but every hive we would get, they would start to do this. We would notice this more and more. Um, we decided to see, oh, is this damaging actually having an effect on plants itself? Right, okay. I'm just going to share screen for one second because I've only got one slide to show, but I'd like you to talk us through it just because it gives it puts into context what you actually discovered. So we'll just have a look at that. Right, so if you could just talk us through what's happening here. Um, this is sort of the bee pretty much attacking the leaf. So what's actually happening? Uh, so as you can see here, um, these are actually photos of a worker bumblebee, which is a female bee. Um, and in the first series of pictures, you can see, so this is a quick time series, and this is actually a leaf of a black mustard plant. And what you can see is that, the first of all, the bee is kind of pinching the plant with her mandibles, and then she is pushing her tongue through to make this kind of little triangle hole, you can see in the first um, set of photos. And then in this photo below, you can kind of see, so this is actually a tomato plant, and you can see the worker is actually really cutting the plant uh, with her mandibles. And this makes this really typical hole that looks like a smile. Um, and the, this is the hole that we really use in all our experiments outside, especially to distinguish bee damage because it is so typical. It's kind of unlike any other herbivore damage that we see. Uh, and this is the photo you can see in, in C. Right, okay. And we've got a little bit of video, so I'll, I'll show that video. Right, so the bee is clearly making a conscious decision to make these holes. First of all, what is it do you think that then triggers, because this triggers the plants to flower earlier, is that right? Yes, so uh, we did experiments where we presented multiple species of different plants, especially kind of crop plants that were pollinated by bumblebees to bumblebees, and kind of without fail, um, every plant that they could get hold of, every plant where they could physically kind of get on the leaf and grab the leaf, um, they would start to damage it. Uh, so this seemed to be kind of very systematic. Um, they would really do it with a number of different species um, and they would really damage the plants. 
we were kind of wondering, oh, well, you know, they are hungry. Maybe they are getting something immediately from the leaf. That was kind of our first thought. Maybe there's some kind of like leaf exudate that they are trying to get. Um, and then we did a lot of filming. We kind of we put filter cones underneath the leaf to see if we could collect anything of the tissue that was being removed. Um, and we also filmed the hives because we wanted to see, oh, maybe they're taking leaf tissue back to their hives. Maybe they're collecting something. But without fail, I mean, they make these damages very quickly. So it only takes a couple of seconds for the bee to make a hole. And then without fail, they would make the hole and they would kind of move on or move to a different plant um, and they would just go foraging. They wouldn't necessarily turn to the hive right away. And in our paper cones that we were collecting all the, the tissue from, they didn't seem to take the tissue with them back to the hive. They were just dropping it and they were filling up these little cones. So they didn't seem to be getting anything specifically from the plant. So then we hypothesized, okay, well, maybe this is having some kind of effect on the plant. So then we started to do some plant flowering experiments. Right. Can you talk us through that? Because that was going to be my next question. My next question was going to be, how did you work out that by damaging the leaf, it was causing the plant to flower earlier? Well, when they were damaging so systematically, we assumed that there must be a reason behind this. And if they're not taking anything straight back to the, to the, the colony, they must be having an effect on the plant. So we wanted to see that. So we devised an experiment specifically um, on plants that we had, that we were regularly using them for damaging, um, which were black mustard, which is known as brassica nigra, and also tomato plants, which are very commonly used in greenhouses and pollinated by bumblebees. So what we did is we had little um, cages of bumblebees and we would put the plants in with the bumblebees and we would make sure they had a, a small amount of damage. So we would calculate whether they had five holes per plant or uh, less than 10 holes per plant. And then we would then subsequently remove the plants. Then what we would do, that would be our bee damage treatment. Then what we would do is pair this bee damage plant to a, a control plant we had that was our mechanical damage treatment. And we would actually replicate the identical damage pattern using razors and forceps on that plant as it had on the bee plant. And then we had a third control, which was a completely untouched, uh, undamaged plant. And then we put all these plants in a very large walking climate chamber and we randomly moved them around to make sure that they had the same abiotic conditions and light conditions every couple of days. Uh, and then we waited to see how long it would take them to flower. Um, just to kind of check all the bases to see what was going to happen to these plants. And kind of what happened to these plants completely shocked us. It completely threw us. It was it was just unbelievable how fast the bee damaged plants would flower. Um, and to some extent, even the mechanical damage seemed to have a little bit of an effect on the flowering and um, probably due to some kind of stress response. But it was significantly less than the bee damaged plants. Uh, and that was really astonishing. Right. So do you think, because clearly the control plant itself that was undamaged flowered later. And the mechanical one was a bit quicker, but not as quick as the bees. So do you think there's something in the, the saliva of the bee or some kind of chemical reaction that they're causing that forces the flowers to grow? I mean, obviously, we've only just published this paper about the behaviour itself, and I can only speculate at this point. Uh, but of course, if we cannot physically replicate um, that response just through uh, physical manipulation of the leaf, there must be something else going on. Um, and immediately we would suspect that there's something in the bee saliva as something that is really triggering this flowering. I mean, that's a very um, kind of logical uh, hypothesis. Um, however, there have been several other uh, papers that describe kind of that plants can really respond, for example, to um, be buzzing or be flying, the, the typical frequency of the bees close to the plants can uh, force the plants to respond with kind of refilling the nectaries or something like that. So there's some kind of BQ um, that is associated with it. Maybe it's kind of pheromonal uh, or chemical. We're not sure yet, but I think the logical um, hypothesis would be there's something in the saliva that's forcing the plant to trigger. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just going to sum up for a second, because I think we've, we've talked a, you know, a lot about what you've done and what your findings are, but I just want to make sure that people understand what we're saying here. So basically, a bee is going to plants and it's driving that plant to flower by manipulating the leaves through 
sort of basically chewing holes in it. So in effect, the bees are farming the flowers. To some extent, it seems the bees are kind of gardening their resources. Um, what for our tomato plants, for example, compared to undamaged plants, um, plants that only had five holes in them, so a really tiny amount of damage, it's really little kind of work for a bee to do, it, it flowered earlier by almost a month. So this is kind of real, really strong manipulation of resources that the bees seem to be doing um, when they are hungry for flowers. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that was going to be my next question is, is how much earlier is it flowering? But that, you know, obviously I've read the paper, so I knew, but I'm glad you prompted it because people that are watching this might not know. That's significant. That's not, it's just, it's flowering by, you know, earlier by a, few, a couple of days, which you could go, all right, well, that's just chance. A month is significant period of time. So it clearly has to be put down to this activity by the bee and that, that's why it's happening. Yeah. Oh, yes, we believe so. I mean, we're still very much in the preliminary stages of this. We would like to test all kinds of different plants and plant families, but in tomato, it definitely seems to have a really strong response, which is also kind of expected because this is a buzz pollinated plant. This is specifically pollinated by bumblebees. So they have this very tight association. Yeah. And so you, you're going to test it with different plants. How many plants? You, you've done it on tomato plant. You've done it on black mustard. Did I say you've done it on eggplant as well? Yes, yeah, so throughout our different experiments, I think we tested the bees on more than 10 different species. So this include a, a whole different bunch of brassica plants, including horseradish and black mustard, and also strawberry plants, and uh, squashes and zucchinis, um, and also eggplant and kind of solanaceous plants that are typically pollinated by bumblebees. Yeah, right, okay. Because it just struck me, and I, I, this is only just coming to my head now. <laughs> Um, by producing the flowers earlier, that I mean, that's basically bringing a potentially a crop forward by a month. So that actually can have quite massive implications for food production. Exactly. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting key observation, not only just for bumblebee ecology in the light of kind of our communities and bumblebee decline, but actually for um, agro agriculture. I mean, a lot of crops are grown in greenhouses and these typically use commercial bumblebees all the time. So this is really interesting, uh, especially for them to think about. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we've mentioned different plants. What about different bumblebee species? You mentioned two in the paper. Have you tested it across numerous different bumblebee species? No, so we use typically our model, which is Bum Bombus terrestris. It's very common across Europe, the buff tailed bumblebee. And when we were doing our garden experiments, we noticed two other species coming in that also damaged our plants. These are both bumblebee species, um, as well as noticing other pollinators visiting, but not damaging. Um, we haven't done the systematic check of, of uh, different bumblebee species. Um, we usually we have been collecting wild queens in spring to establish our own research hives, but we also typically order commercially available hives, and these really concentrate on a few species. It's something we're really looking forward to do in the future to kind of look across the whole phylogeny um, of different bumblebee species to see is this systematic across the whole um, bombus genera, but or is this something that's really kind of contained to just a few species? We don't know, and hopefully it's something we'll find out. <laughs> right, okay. and. Uh again, this is a question off the top of my head, but if bumblebees are doing it, and you, you might not have done any testing whatsoever, so you probably won't know the answer to this, but is, is there a likelihood that other species, for instance, honeybees, are also doing the same type of thing? It's very interesting. Um, it's something we've hypothesised about. I obviously can only speculate <laughs> at this stage. Yeah. Um, What's very unique about bumblebees is this kind of annual life cycle and the fact that in spring the queen really has to immediately establish a hive and she has a really pressing need for flowers in the early stages. Um, bumblebees have a really high failure rate, unfortunately. Um, I think in some references these founding colonies have a mortality of like 80%. And this is often put down to the fact that they don't have flowers available 
And for the bubble bees, in order to grow and produce um, their ne next generation of reproductives, it's really important they have a continuous supply of available flowers that are effectively able to be reached within their flight distance of the hive. Um, and this is kind of critical. Um, in comparison to honeybees, honeybee colonies can kind of live multiple years and they uh, produce gynes on multiple occasions through these kind of multiple generations of years. And you don't have such a pressing need kind of within one year, it's not kind of uh, fail or, or win, it's kind of a bit more nuanced compared to that. Um, if a bumblebee colony fails, there's literally kind of no reproductive success. The queen is kind of out of the gene pool, if that makes sense. So she really has to kind of get to that stage. Um, and also compared to solitary bees, they often have a much shorter life cycle compared to um, a bumblebee colony. So they also might not necessarily need to have a continuous supply of flowers throughout the season. So the bumblebees seem to be in this really unique position where it's really pressing that they get flowers um, and therefore a damaging behaviour might be adaptive or a helpful solution to kind of mitigate those issues. Um, there's also been a lot of research looking at kind of bumblebee hunger gaps across seasons because our landscapes are so highly modified at the moment and we have these kind of very simplified agricultural landscapes that also exacerbate this problem. However, that being said, um, this discovery has only just been made. People typically don't look at vegetative plants and bees. Typically, we look for bees on flowers rather than vegetative plants. Um, it's really surprising to me that people have not noticed these holes, but they, no one seems to have seen this behavior. So I think it could very well be that maybe some solitary bees do damage plants that we just haven't noticed up until this point. Um, but again, it's just speculation. Yeah, yeah. So where next for this study? What, what, what are you going to move on to do that relates to this study? Well, uh, for me in particular, we're hoping to submit our follow up very soon. Um, we're really trying to show again, we've shown that the bumblebees can perform this behaviour, but we always were a little bit reluctant to say that they were gardening because we need to kind of show that there's an adaptive benefit. And that is what we've been investigating um, subsequently to this is really looking at is there a reliable uh, fitness and adaptive benefit where they are more successful if they have access to earlier pollen compared to colonies that really don't. Um, and this is something we hope to show that they are really kind of farming their resources. That's kind of the next step. <laughs> yeah. You've also preempted another question because that was going to be the question I was going to ask. If you had a control hive and you had a, a hive that was actually, you know, doing this to the plants, was there any success? But clearly that's what you were, you know, did they have more success than the control hive? But clearly that's what you're working on now. So maybe we'll talk again in the future about the findings on that one. I hope so. I think in our lab, it's quite nice. We have a really interesting mix of kind of semi-natural outdoor experiments with our gardens, uh, but we also do quite a lot of lab-based kind of microcolony experiments where we can really kind of shift down and try to disentangle these effects, which are much harder to do outside yeah yeah well it's a fantastic piece of research it, 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 the papers i mean even i understood most of it and i don't pretend to be a scientist um but it, it's really really good and it's it's amazing that like you said that people haven't noticed this before you know they they are not overly common but you know people get them in the garden you'd think that somebody one day might just look and go what is that doing there you know and yet for years and years and years it's gone unnoticed so it is a fantastic piece of research and uh, so thank you for that and thanks for your time because you know i when i saw the paper when i first saw i think you put it on twitter or something like that and i saw it and i thought i have got to talk to this person um so thank you ever so much for your time and maybe when you get the next update we'll talk again about you know where you're taking the research that that sounds great i have to say um since we re actually released this um, this paper, I've been inundated by messages from people being like, oh, I've seen this in my garden. I've wondered what the bees were doing. Um, I've even taken photos and, and here you go. So I would strongly urge anyone, if you're in your garden, if you're watching the workers, I think it's super interesting that maybe you can spot bumblebees making holes in plants. <laughs> Too right. And so is, th is there a specific, now it might sound like a daft question, but I know that I'll get asked it. 
is it a specific time of the year to be looking for that? Because obviously plants pollinate at different stages. Bees, uh, particularly um, the buff tails, come out quite early. So are there particular conditions that people should go, well, yeah, it's been a particularly cold spring, so I'll look, or is it just general? So that's also an interesting question. So when we were doing some of our diet experiments where we were seeing under what conditions they were damaged, we found that almost continuously they would do very low, very small amounts of damage. But when they were very hungry, they would do very high levels of damage. So if you really want to see this behavior, I would suggest, I mean, in early spring where they are, have this pressing need to establish their colonies, where they have a really urgent need for pollen and they have to grow um, extensively, probably between the months of March and June, you would probably see, have a, a good chance to see this in your garden. <laughs> right, brilliant. Okay, so between March and June, we go check. It's still June. I might nip out and just have a look. <laughs> I, it's, it's brilliant, it really is. So for now, I think we'll leave it there until you've done your next paper and then we'll have a chat about that to give people an update because I'm sure that this will create a lot of interest. A lot of people will be sort of looking to sort of try and get hold of the paper. Now, the paper, when I first tried to get hold, it was um, now that it was on Science Magazine, but it's on subscription. Is that the only place to get hold of the paper? Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, it is the only place to get hold of the paper, but we do have a link to the freely available text. So people can find uh, my institutional mail and they can email me if they're really interested and I can send them a link to the freely available paper. Brilliant. Is it is it worth me putting the link underneath the video on the YouTube channel so that people can get to it or do they have to come through you? No, no, I can, I can provide you with the link. Oh, brilliant. I'm just thinking because you might be opening the floodgates there to your email box, be flooded with people going, can I have it, can I have it? So right, I will put that underneath and people can sort of read the elements of the paper, you know, for themselves. Um, but for now, thank you ever so much for your time, Harriet, and good luck with the next phase. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye. Bye.